And uh, up now we have my co-organizer, Jason Cohen, uh, talking about secure security development lifecycle and static code analysis. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Sorry, just a second. My mouse decided to stop working. There it is. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Fraser, for the introduction. Um, uh, so um, my name is Jason Cohen. Uh, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, to Australia and escape in the winter weather in my home state of Maryland. Uh, the, the title of the talk today is uh, Make More Secure Code, an Overview of Static Development Lifecycle and Static Code Analysis. Um, I'm pretty sure I have more content than I have time, so I have some stuff I'm going to go for a little quickly, and certainly hit me up if you have any questions later. So a little bit about me, um, really quickly. Um, I'm a technology consultant at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, like I said. I've been there for um, actually 10 years uh, this year, in a, in a month or so. Um, and I've worked uh, 16 years or so overall, uh, mainly for the Department of Defense in the US. So I've seen a lot of changes in the industry and certainly in the company um, over, the, over the past years and kind of been involved in a lot of different genres um, in terms of, uh, of computing, anything from system administration early on to um, you know, um, uh, software design and development and uh, systems engineering. So uh, a little bit of a handyman, I guess, which is something I guess we all kind of need to be these days, um, especially in terms of development where uh, we have um, you know, so many security threats that, that uh, can be um, dealt with at, a, at the uh, application layer um, if we understand how to do so. And that involves being a little bit of a, 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 um, a jack of all trades in the cyber realm and the development realm. <clears throat> oh, and thanks to Hewlett Packard for uh, sponsoring and uh, helping me get here. And um, I'm not representing them necessarily, uh, their products or anything, but uh, certainly buy their servers if you, if you like them. And uh, thanks, most importantly, to my uh, wife and uh, my kids for letting me get out here. <clears throat> uh, so quick agenda. Um, this is a real big topic. You can find talks, papers, entire text uh, developed dedicated to you know, every aspect of this. Um, so uh, you know, uh, we can't really get too deep in a 30 minute talk, but um, kind of give you a, a general overview of static code develop, um, of analysis and how it fits into an overall secure software development lifecycle. Because you, um, you really need to make use of both tools and, um, and also um, uh, you know, an architectural approach to security uh, to make more secure code. And um, it really points to provide a starting point for those interested in um, improving security of the product, product, yeah, projects if they're you know, not already leveraging these techniques, or also for anybody that's you know, maybe just getting out of school or getting into programming and really haven't given these things a lot of thought, and just some general food for thought, of course. <clears throat> um, before I even start, there's a couple resources you should definitely consider looking at if you haven't already. I mean, number one for the open source community would be the uh, the Web Application Security Project. Uh, it's got a lot of great information. I certainly um, borrowed a lot of their <laughs> um, diagrams for, for this talk. Um, if you're interested in some of the technical details of how static code analysis works, it's a pr pretty good book. It's uh, a couple years old. It's um, by some of the guys that created Fortify. And um, for in regards to the security um, development lifecycle, there's um, uh, a lot of books out there. This one is by um, a guy from Microsoft that helped implement it there. And certainly at Microsoft's um, website, they were one of the kind of companies that really kind of started driving the, the idea of developing a formal model for um, security development. And um, so they have some pretty good stuff there. Yeah. So yeah, in case you didn't know, we still have problems with cybersecurity. And uh, if it was Donald Trump talking about it, uh, you know, you might be able to ignore it. But uh, with Don King standing next to him, you know, you certainly know it's a big problem, right? Uh, <laughs> so this is a, a, a chart I got from the Australian uh, Department of Defense um, talking about top, I don't know how many reasons, 35 reasons, uh, or excuse me, things you can do to reduce your, you know, um, uh, susceptibility to, to cyber um, uh, attacks. 
And what you won't find on this list is uh, anything regarding uh, improving the security of code that you develop. Um, so unless you're completely outsourced all your your stuff to outside services, um, uh, you know, um, you might have some stuff you develop internally, and it's certainly that's 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 what the, the um, you can not only can rely on the outside mitigation factors to um, to to protect you to a certain extent, and this is kind of like the traditional view of security to this point. But yet we still see a lot of um, security issues that could be uh, addressed in um, you know in the application layer, and I'm not picking on any particular projects. I'm just throwing these out there because they were headlines. Um, and, uh, you know, we certainly heard a lot in this past year about, like, APT-style attacks that are focusing on compromising a particular user and gaining access. But even those, to some extent, could be um, mitigated through certain um, application layer defenses, like, uh, like some of the multi-factor stuff was talked about earlier, uh, for instance. <clears throat> and although um, since, uh, you know, in the past couple years even, uh, since the open SSL vulnerability, um, we've seen definitely some improvement and definitely a lot um, more projects utilizing uh, the static code analysis tools out there and things like that. So bugs are on, you know, becoming a bit harder to find. But then again, the consequences of failed security is becoming increasingly serious. And, um, you know, for instance, as devices um, go into people's bodies, um, like was kind of talked about earlier today in the, um, in the opening talk, um, uh, and, uh, you know, vehicles, for instance, a lot of uh, vehicle stuff is, is based on open source Linux <coughs> and um, or IoT devices, of course, and they become, you know, safety hazards. There's also legal implications. Um, the Federal Trade Commission made it known that they're going to start going after companies that aren't taking adequate measures um, in terms of security. This uh, lawsuit was just filed recently against uh, D-Link uh, for uh, their, some of their IoT and router devices having terrible security, as we know. And it's not a unique problem. I mean, everybody has it, including the intelligence community. <clears throat> so we know the traditional assumptions really just aren't working. Um, you know, the, the given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Um, I think that uh, the open source has been based on certainly very valid. I think that um, uh, that it, it's it's it, the open software is great. It helps um, having people review it. But the question is, who's reviewing it? Are they qualified enough? Um, if it's just a core team of developers reviewing it, there might be some. You know, it's uh, it's kind of um, easy to ignore your own mistakes, maybe things like that. A good example, um, going back a ways, was. Um, when his firewall toolkit was put out, he, he mentioned that he had 2,000 sites using it, but only 10 people gave him any sort of feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, with the assumptions that old code is stable, we're seeing bugs that were in, introduced in code many years ago that are just showing up as people really start digging and digging into it, trying to find vulnerabilities. Um, the component-based software development um, is certainly eliminates uh, some common problems, but then again, when something creeps up, it spreads like wildfire. Uh, same with um, frameworks. and, uh, and and, and uh, along the same lines. <clears throat> so who's examining the um, open source security? Um, well, there's, there's, there are a lot of people looking at it, and they have different um, motivational factors, um, you know, from, you know, general kind of hackers that might be uh, motivated by uh, criminal activities, um, you know, uh, mal uh, development malware, ransomware kind of thing to make money. There's people that uh, just want to do it for the fun. Um, this guy I saw at DEF CON a few years ago, um, uh, when he was uh, talking about a Google product he exploited called the engineers a bunch of effing idiots, which isn't very nice, but, you know, that's a motivational factor, too. And, uh, of course, you have um, uh, companies that have sprouted up to want to do research so they can produce firewalls for you or application layered firewalls for you that can help protect you. Of course, they want to make money. Uh, the bug bounty programs want to make you know, money. Um, and uh, academia is doing a lot of stuff, but they have a publish or die mentality. And of course, uh, your local uh, intelligence agency, um, they have their motivations as well. And you know, people think about backdoors and products and such, but um, you know, they really don't need them when they, they can find, um, uh, do their own analysis and, and find, find, find issues to, um, to exploit. <clears throat> And like I said, the demand for exploits is really drawing a lot of, lot of uh, money, especially now, because um, the, the quality code is improving. And um, so this stuff is becoming a lot harder to find. It's not less, you know, it's becoming more of a, um, a specialized industry, if you will. And um, just recently, this Irish um, developer uh, who found a bug in uh, a port in um, Ubuntu, <clears throat> he said he was offered $10,000 for, for the bug. And if you found something uh, and you, you know, that, that had to do with encrypting data on a server, surely, um, and you had a, you know, 
criminal uh, mind to you, you would you could make you know certainly hundreds of thousands of dollars on ransomware. And it's uh, it's really a systemic problem. It starts um, really in the you know the typical model that people get into to this this field. They they go to school to study computer science maybe, um, and they learn how to program as part of that, how to design software. But a lot of times the security aspects really not embedded into those programs um, as in the syllabus here from the place where I went to school um, you know, for software um, engineering. Um, and you know, it's something that really needs to be incorporated really early on into the process. And, and there's also a balancing act. <clears throat> of course, there's uh, the idea that uh, uh, intellectual property gets stale quickly, so you need to get stuff out the door and you're, you got modern development um, ideals um, of, of getting rapid prototypes out, that kind of thing. You need to make money, maybe. Um, so, you know, and then you got to balance that against taking the time for a secure architecture because, as you know, problems that get into the code um, that aren't fixed early on end up costing more to fix later. Um, and then taking the time uh, for develop developer training as well, like I said. <clears throat> um, so, you know, uh, this, this um, report was put out by Coverity a few years ago. They do a, um, they, do, they have a service where they do a static code analysis for, um, it's free for open source projects, and I'll show you that a little bit later here. Um, so uh, they, they, in their, their um, research, they showed that uh, closed source code is, tends to be more, more compliant, but that is improving. Um, and as, in fact, the, the Linux kernel itself and quite a few other projects now, I think they said over 5,000 are using their service. Now that that's a panacea, it's not gonna find architectural flaws, but uh, it's certainly a good, good place to start. <clears throat> So on a positive note, like I said, more and more people are making use of automated tools, um, 5,000 open source projects using Coverity. Um, the quality is improving with the reduction of these obvious flaws that are really easy to catch for static, static code analysis. Um, and it's requiring more, more time and skill now to, um, to this. And, and in academic programs, uh, they are starting to sneak um, some security classes. A lot of times it's electives, but um, they're, they're moving into that. Um, so yeah, there's a multi, part approach to this, and it's kind of wrapping security around the whole, the whole process. And there's, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution, um, and uh, we need to, to, to think about it when we're designing the code, when they're implementing it, and when it's in this operation and support stage. <clears throat> so of course, in open source projects, um, it, they have their, their own difficulties um, that are kind of unique and obvious, I suppose, um, when you're trying to implement some sort of standard, um, you know, especially if the project's been around for a while um, and it's, uh, you know, not controlled necessarily by a corporation or something like that. It's uh, getting enough people together and put out some standards um, and also uh, convincing uh, developers to, to participate in peer review and to utilize the tools that, um, that they can use. <clears throat> and also, of course, you have various levels of developers that are devoting their time to the project, and some of them may be better, better than others. So uh, a little bit about the security development lifecycle. It's been abbreviated SDL or S, SDLC, whatever you want to call it. So if you're a project of one or, or of a, a thousand, you know, there are certain different challenges, of course, in, in implementing this, but um, not to mention if it's a company or community. But uh, no matter what the size, I think you could probably take some ideas away from this and apply it to what you're working on, um, whether it be at work or, or you know, personal project or community project. <clears throat> and not a lot of people like Microsoft necessarily, but they actually have a, a pretty reasonable um, recommendations. Uh, they realized in the, before um, Windows Vista that they needed to, um, to put in a, a process in place to, to help get their code better. <laughs> And uh, so they came up with this. It's a bit of a kind of a waterfall model. It can be adapted a bit to agile frameworks, as I'll show you on the next slide. But essentially, um, you're taking the major uh, process areas of uh, development and adding security to each one of those. And I'll, I'll talk about each one of these in more detail in coming slides. But <clears throat> like I said, uh, for agile, obviously, you can split this up uh, as needed. So if you're, for instance, working on a sprint, you might not need to do a full uh, requirements um, phase again, so you can, you can adjust it as you see fit, but pick, pick and choose the major processes out of it that makes sense to do. Um, another thing to look at, too, is um, the uh, Open Web Application Security Project's uh, assurance maturity model. Uh, they have a document there that a lot of um, companies have contributed to and community people, and um, it's more of a, a higher level um, 
document if you're trying to implement something for your company. Um, it's not so much technical, but it's kind of very similar to the, to the Microsoft model, but not uh, a lot of the, the Microsoft stuff talks specifically about their development environments and um, their, their tool chains and stuff, and this is a little bit more generic. <clears throat> um, okay, so the number one uh, thing and the first thing in, in, uh, in this life cycle, of course, is uh, education, training, and it's all about empowering the developer and taking some personal responsibility for yourself, too, if you're a developer and, and learning about the, the new things that are, um, that are out there. So there's a big difference between security features and security programming. Um, a lot of developers understand the need for passwords, things like that. This is a famous picture here. I'm not sure where I got it from, but uh, you can see the security feature is the, uh, is the roadblock, but you can just drive around it. So this is, this is um, you know, a common, uh, common problem. <clears throat> and uh, of course, he who doesn't understand history is doomed to repeat it. Um, so you need to make a point to spend some time um, to study. Um, you need to research past vulnerabilities that are related to what you're working on. Uh, read security research blogs, especially ones with detailed analysis. You know, you can skip past the, you know, your ZDNet stuff and crap like that and get to some details. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also some emergent training programs you can look into as well. <clears throat> And um, if you're a company, yeah, provide your engineers with uh, some training budget, too, and funding, and maybe implement some sort of uh, standards, like, you know, you got to spend a certain amount of hours a year uh, doing training. So uh, get to know the major flaws. Um, uh, these are um, the, from uh, the um, uh, Open uh, Web Application Security Project. They always have their list. It hasn't been, I think it's getting ready to be updated this year. Um, but each one you can go through and they show you examples of how to um, uh, recognize it and of course how to, um, how to avoid uh, that issue in, the, in your code. And the examples might be more generic so you can always find detailed uh, specifics for a particular language too. Another good place to look is MITRE's uh, CWE, the Common um, Weakness Enumeration Database. They have their own list of top 25, they're highly similar. Um, and they also give you um, some good information on how to avoid those, those issues. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, so there's over a thousand weaknesses that have been identified um, in this database. Um, I, I'd like to, to maybe take a little time when you are uh, doing your, uh, thinking about the project to, to look through some that have been shown up, shown up in other similar projects so you can kind of understand what you might be up against and some ways to go against it. And, uh, another thing to consider is, um, is looking at the um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Mellon has some uh, secure coding standard documents um, that also um, give you some, uh, some tips on how to, re uh, the, well, for one, like stylistic things, but also um, how to um, avoid some of the common uh, flaws as well. <clears throat> um, this guy, uh, David Wheeler, has got a free book. He created the, the Static Code Analysis Tool um, Flaw Finder. And it's a free web book. Uh, it's worth uh, looking at. It's um, kind of focused on uh, open and um, open source and Linux uh, in particular. <clears throat> uh, like I said, uh, this is another site. Um, the CV details. You can look at similar products, and they have it broken down by the type of vulnerability, and do a little research on um, on how they might be related to what, what the product you're working on. And then, of course, find a blog that really gets into the details. <clears throat> A couple of secure coding things that to consider. Um, defense in depth um, is something thrown around a lot, especially in the DoD, but it, people try to avoid doing uh, code duplication, but in, in some, some instances, it's, it's, if you can afford the performance penalty, you're getting some data back from another outside framework that's supposed to sanitize the code, maybe yeah, look at it again, do another sanity check on it before you, know, you, you, you do something with it that's, that's dangerous. Um, uh, don't depend on the user, of course, to be a security feature. You make your updates easy. Uh, consider new ways of protecting um, data in this age of APT, um, like encryption in all stages um, of, uh, from, um, you know, from network transport to storage with strong key protections, multi-factor authentication, and of course, uh, detailed security event logging. So when something goes wrong, um, your, people are using your stuff can kind of figure out maybe what, what happened. And users will be users, of course, keep that in mind. Um, you know, if they're allowed to leave things in insecure state, they probably will. So if you can think of ways to, you know, force them to um, or randomly generate new password for some sort of IoT device, for instance, or, uh, but then again, don't be too abusive because if they have to change their password 30 days, uh, every 30 days and it's 20 characters long, they will make bad passwords and write them down and stuff. <clears throat> 
Yeah, and, and like I said, in, uh, it's difficult to do this in a community project, but um, it provides gentle encouragement if you're doing code peer reviews and you, you see um, somebody making mistakes. <clears throat> so requirements, um, it, nobody likes really this phase. <laughs> I think uh, developers may, might not, but it's a good time to tease out uh, some of the security features that are going to be implemented, and it's going to uh, be a way to enumerate um, some of the risk early on in the, in the project. <clears throat> In the design phase, this is probably one of the most important parts to avoid architectural flaws. Um, you're going to want to uh, try to flush out for your standard software um, design documents like your data flow diagrams, user interaction diagrams, and kind of convert those into um, attack uh, surface analysis and threat models. <clears throat> and I say, why not publish these documents at the end of the process too? Because that way, uh, you know, whoever's going to be using your system in the end, your application in the end. Um, can think of their own ways that to, to work around some of the um, some of the security concerns that, that are to come up in your in your threats. I'll add a multi-layer approach. Uh, attack service analysis is simply um, looking at all the paths the data is coming in and out of the system, and um, and recording essentially what you're going to do about it. This way, when you go back into um, when you're testing your code, you can go back and look at this and make sure everything that you initially thought of is going to be covered in your test cases. Threat modeling is probably the most important. You can read a whole book about this topic. Um, and it's essentially taking your, um, your data flows and inserting trust boundaries into them and, um, and also ranking the, the type of threats um, that, that you're going to see in, in terms of their likelihood and uh, what they're going to do, if they, uh, how much damage they might do, and kind of uh, stack that on your, in your, um, I don't know, your queue of how important it is to address. Uh, this is a, a, an example threat model where you took a DFD and added um, uh, those dotted uh, red lines, which are the um, uh, threat, uh, excuse me, the uh, trust boundaries, <clears throat> and essentially where data is coming in and out from an untrusted uh, source. Uh, Stride is a way to kind of document um, th those, those type, um, types of threats, um, and they're based on spoofing, tampering, repu non repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service. An elevation of privilege, um, so you can go through and, and, and create a document that, that, that has these different things, and, and then conversely, what you're going to do to mitigate those in terms of security control. And then um, it can be helpful to diagram, um, like shown here, you have um, uh, root path analysis um, in the top diagram um, and ways that you're going to mitigate it there on the bottom, the green blocks. <clears throat> And use and abuse cases, take the use cases that are diagrammed and also and add a hacker, you know, a malicious user, and, uh, and show points where he's going to possibly attack. But these are places that you're going to want to focus on more when you're actually implementing the code. Um, and uh, so Dread is a way to, to rank those threats. Um, if you have the time to, to do that, it's, uh, it's a way to focus um, your, your attention to the most serious things when you're uh, doing the, your code reviews. And you know, even a well thought out design can fail. One of the, the things I threw in my headlines earlier was that TCP flaw. Uh, that was actually an, based on a, a very well vetted RFC um, that, uh, that Linux imp implemented faithfully. Um, but uh, some um, researchers spent uh, a lot of time uh, piddling with it and, uh, and realized that uh, it, could be, uh, it could be broken and um, to, to major consequences. So implementation phase is um, where you are going to implement uh, the project, of course, and uh, implement with the coding standards you decided on, and uh, track the agreed security features, make sure they're being done, and also uh, conduct regular static code analysis and uh, regular peer reviews is probably even more important. Uh, the static code analysis is um, a process of um, assessing the quality of the code without executing it. Um, it's really, if you're a computer science buff, it's an MP hard problem, so you, you can't really do it to 100% detail. So to get around that, there's a lot of different ways that these tools work, including the heuristics, pattern matching, things like that. And the different tools do this slightly differently, too, which hopefully I'll have a second here um, to show you a couple of ways that they're different. Um, and use it early and often. Tie it in with a, a continuous integration server if you can, if you're doing that, that type of development. And then each day, you know, whatever the, the build happens, you get a report back and uh, kind of try to address things as you go along. Um, yeah, so I don't have time to get into all of this, but it, for, they work different ways. Like I said, it, it can be a simple pattern match type of thing to something that builds a, um, a model based on kind of similar way that the compiler works and then conducts like a data flow and taint analysis to try to figure out 
where stuff is coming in from user input or network input, to making sure you're sanitizing the input. Uh, here are some, uh, some, some tools. Um, you can find some list of them out there. Uh, I was going to show you, hopefully, the Coverity. I um, uh, might have to uh, um, not take questions if I do it, but um, I think it's important to show you a couple tools. Um, the Coverity um, uh, thing is a commercial tool, but it's free to use for um, open source projects. I highly recommend signing up for that. You can also find um, a lot of projects that are already out there um, on their site. If you are a contributing member, you can request access. They probably will not give it to any random person because they don't want security researchers taking advantage of this and you know finding flaws and when these people are really just trying to improve their code. Um, uh, you know, besides that, uh, the, the Fortify product um, I'm just going to show you. Uh, there's a, a Sonar, uh, a, also a free end. They also have a commercial product, um, a Visual Code Grepper, um, and Five Security blog, Bugs is a Java bit, uh, thing that uh, can be plugged into Eclipse. <clears throat> Uh, like I said, you have different integration options, whether it's an IDE running as a separate process or continuing integration. There's also cloud um, options as well. Um, challenges, if you're auditing old code, it's, it's a pain. I mean, you got, you know, if, especially if you didn't help develop the code, uh, it's a really difficult thing to do from start. That's why it's really good to do it um, when you're, you're talking about new projects and getting it in early in the process. Um, and it's still recommended to do dynamic testing. Uh, limitations, uh, can't find anything, everything. Obviously, just didn't find shell shock. I didn't find. Although since then, uh, they've improved uh, some of these tools to be able to detect um, the issue to cause shell, shell shock, which is just better taint analysis. <clears throat> and there's still a need for manual peer review so you can avoid something like this, which actually wasn't a problem with um, this key, um, th this application itself. But one of the setup scripts where it dumps to a shell if you hit the enter key more than 30 times. <clears throat> and commercial solutions can be cost prohibitive uh, for open source, of course, too. And uh, verification is important after you, uh, before the project is out the door via uh, fuzz testing and, um, uh, and runtime analysis, if, if possible. If you have a good test team, they're going to utilize these tools. It's, it's really good if a developer can help write fuzz testing and dynamic testing because uh, they know the code and they're the best people, really, to help assist with that process. And uh, real quickly, of course, assemble the final team to conduct the final security review. Uh, no go, no go decision. And of course, um, try to, to, to document um, anything in your, in your documentation that the end user should be aware of. <clears throat> All right. Do I? I don't know. Well, I got about five, two minutes. <laughs> OK. So this is Visual Code Grep. Um, this is a sort of somewhat simplistic, um, oops. All right, I don't know how to, crap. Yeah, that works. It's a kind of a simplistic way um, to, to do a code analysis. It, um, it basically does pattern matching for different known kind of bad coding properties, but it doesn't look at the code overall. Uh, this is an analysis it did of, um, of uh, OpenSSL, a vulnerable version of it. Um, and then it can give you a nice little pie chart with uh, places to look. Uh, and then um, if you pull up a particular file that it an analyzed, um, it'll, it'll walk through the different things. Now, like I said, if it, you're looking at an old project, you're going to get a ton of hits with this, and it's going to be kind of difficult to go through. Although the highlighted line there is, in fact, where the um, uh, uh, Harpley vulnerability was. So I suppose if somebody uh, really did this and look through it, they might have found that and, and fixed it. Um, so, over here is a tool called Flaw Finder. Uh, again, it works in a very similar fashion. Um, it's primarily for C, C++ code. It's, um, it was written by uh, David Wheeler I mentioned earlier. And it gives you something organized by the, the common weakness um, that it's uh, associated with. And um, Again, I believe this did, yeah, also identifies that particular buffer flow. But, you know, it, one thing it doesn't know, if it's looking at a particular file, whether you're doing sanitation somewhere else in the program. So that's kind of a weakness of this style of, um, of detection tools. On the other hand, if you have something like this, is a commercial tool called Fortify, um, you can, um, it, it, it 
injects itself into the compilation project for compiled code, and it um, does a more detailed kind of flow through the entire application. Um, it tries to at least, and again, it, it detects um, the issue. Oh, this is a, sorry, hold on a sec. Ah, yeah, this is the OpenSSL uh, vulnerability detected by Fortify. I wouldn't have done this before, for, uh, before the, that uh, was released, in all fairness. They did add some better heuristics to try to detect this. What I really like about this, um, it, uh, it breaks down a nice little diagram, too, so you can help trace back uh, where the tank came from. Uh, one thing you will note, it found quite a few other vulnerabilities in the code, <laughs> um, and uh, you would be hard-pressed to you know, go through each of these and determine if they're real vulnerabilities or not, but uh, certainly could be some other ones out there waiting to be found. Um, all right. Okay. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, I was going to sh show you another one, but you get the idea, I think. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to approach me. And uh, thanks again. Well, thank you very much, Jason, for that uh, secure development tour de force. Uh, it's now afternoon tea. Uh, after afternoon tea in our final session. Up first we have Christopher Biggs giving a talk on IoT security, uh, the internet of scary things. And uh, talking of scary things, after that is a talk on internet ghosts. Woo! And uh, after that I'll be doing a very quick uh, free IPA project update. And our final talk of the day uh, is by Alexander Hogue, a talk on uh, physical security, and um, what we can learn about that from magician's techniques. So hope you'll uh, be keen to come back for the final session. Thanks. <laughs>